Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about data organization and display. How do we take a huge amount of data and then organize it so that we can understand it just by looking at the table or the graph or the figure? And in this lecture, we'll talk about frequency tables. We'll talk about cumulative frequency tables. We'll get an introduction to the normal curve. And if you stick around at the very end, I will show you how to do some of this in Excel. Okay, so this comes from chapter two of the textbook, Statistics in Kinesiology. This is an older edition, but it's still a good one. The newest edition has been put out in 2020 by Ware and Vincent. It's a great textbook, and it will be linked in the description. Now, some key terms to start. The first is rank order distribution. This is an ordered listing of data in a single column. It's only useful with relatively small number of values. So if you have, say, 10 to 20 values that you've collected, well, it might be a good idea to sort those in order of rank, highest to lowest or lowest to highest. The next is a range. The range is the distance from that highest value down to the lowest value. It's essentially the number of units in between the highest and lowest value. And then we can see how you can calculate it mathematically here. High value minus low value. And here's an example. Let's say that you are measuring upper body pulling strength using a vertical pulling movement pattern and you're going to use pull-ups. And if you had um, 15 people, you can see here n equals 15. n typically denotes the sample size. Oops. Sample. So you have 15 people do as many pull-ups as they can and you can see here that we have ranked them. So it's really easy to see what the highest is and what the lowest is, and we could calculate that range, would be, which would be 18 minus 2 equals 16, and you can see that right down here. Now the next way to display data is with a simple frequency distribution. So in this type of chart, all we're doing is we're listing out different um, bins of scores, essentially a high and a low score for each of these bin ranges, and then we denote in a second column how many scores occurred in that range. So let's take a look at what this looks like. And I'm going to zoom in for you a little bit here. Okay, so simple frequency distribution of pull-up scores. So now let's say that we collected more data and now our N is much larger, 212. And so even if we ranked 212 scores all in a row, it's still going to be hard to really figure out the trends in that data when you're looking at such a huge range. So now we have this frequency distribution. And we can see that going down the X column, we have the number of pull-ups completed. So if you completed 20 pull-ups, then you would be counted here in this number. Oops, that's a bad arrow. Counted here. And it looks like two people completed 20 pull-ups. Nobody completed 19 pull-ups, 18, sorry, three people completed 18 pull-ups, and so on down the line. And we can see just by glancing at this that the vast majority of people fell somewhere in the middle, somewhere between, let's say, nine and 14 pull-ups is where the vast majority of scores fell. And we often see that in statistics, um, in kinesiology, but also in other fields where the most um, or the greatest frequency is in that middle range. So this simple frequency distribution is a great way to display scores when you have more than 20 scores to work with. Now we also have what's called a grouped frequency distribution. And in this type of distribution, instead of having a single score per row, we have a group of scores per row. So maybe instead of 20, 19, 18, et cetera, maybe it's if you got 15 to 20 pull-ups, and then if you got um, 10 to 14 pull-ups, and then if you got you know, five to nine pull-ups, then those would be your groups, and we would tally the number of scores in each of those groups. So we typically want to use this, as I said, when the sample is greater than 20 and the range is also greater than 20, so it's a large range. Typically we want to form somewhere around 15 groups, but of course this is going to be up to the investigator to decide. And here interval size is denoted by I. You would calculate interval size 
by dividing the range by 15 if you wanted 15 groups. Or you could divide the range by 10 if you just wanted 10 groups and that would give you your interval size. Now here is an example of a group frequency distribution using mile runtime. So we can imagine that if you're timing a mile runtime and then you want to display it in seconds, it will be very, very cumbersome to list every single second out. And what's more, because this data is not discrete, meaning it doesn't fall um, integer to integer, it's actually continuous, meaning you can have decimals, then it would be impossible to really list every single score that's possible for a mile run. So instead of doing that, we group them. And these groups look like they have 20 seconds within each group. Okay, so as we examine this table, we can quickly see that there were three people who scored the longest time, so these would be the slowest individuals, and two people up here at the top, and in the middle is where, again, the majority of the scores fell. If we add up all of these frequency scores, then we get the total number, which is 206 individuals either by creating a rank order distribution or a simple frequency or a grouped frequency table. But we can also display data using graphs. So the first type of graph is called a histogram. And we're going to see pictures of all of these here in a second. It's a bar graph that shows you the frequency, again, of each either data, um, that shows you the frequency either of each score or of each group of scores. A frequency polygon, which is essentially showing you the same thing, but then you could, if you wanted to, calculate the area under that polygon curve. And then we also have what's called a cumulative frequency graph. And this is a line graph of ordered scores on the x-axis plotted against the number of subject, subjects who scored at or below this score on the y-axis. And so that one is a little bit unique. We'll spend some time on that one here in a minute. So here is a sample of a spreadsheet. So up until this point, we've been looking at data sets that have only a single variable being measured, whether it was the number of pull-ups or the number of seconds in the mile run. But if we have multiple variables, and often it's going to be best to display this in table form. Now, here we see we only have five subjects. And imagine, though, if we had 100 subjects or 1,000 subjects, then we would start with it in table form, where you have the subjects in the first column on the left. And then in the columns to the right of that, you have each variable listed out with the heading along the top, okay? So it should say from left to right, it should say subject, and then variable one, variable two, variable three, et cetera. And then each row is devoted to each individual subject. So we can see here in this table that subject two's body weight and height are listed here. So here's their weight and here's their height, and there's their body mass index. And so all of these scores on this row go together. Now here's a picture of the histogram that I mentioned, and this should look similar to the frequency charts that we actually looked at a minute ago, except for instead of a number, we have a bar, okay? So whereas the frequency chart, we had the score and the frequency coming down this way. Let's say those are the scores, and these are the frequencies, right? You could turn those into little bars coming out sideways. All right, and form a kind of a sideways histogram. Well, the histogram is just that same thing, flipped 90 degrees. And so now we can easily see that, okay, it looks like 85 to 90 seconds was the mode in this case. The mode, we'll learn later, is the score or the group of scores within which the most people scored. It's the greatest frequency of scores. We can see that the frequency drops off at the tails. Now here's a frequency polygon. And again, the only reason that this is nice instead of a histogram is because now we can start to maybe calculate the area under this curve if we wanted to. And it's just a different visual representation of the same data. Okay, finally, we have the cumulative frequency. Now, the cumulative frequency table, this is a little bit different than what we've looked at so far. In this case, there are three columns. Not only do we have the familiar X column for scores, and then the F column for the frequency. We've seen that before, 
But now we also have the cumulative number of people who scored at or below that given score in each group. Okay, so let's start at the bottom of the table and we will work our way up. So people who scored between one and three on the parallel bar dip test, there were six of them. Okay, so the cumulative number of people who scored three or below would be six. If we look at the next one up, four to six reps, 10 people scored that. And so the number of people who scored at six or below would be 16, okay? Because we are actually adding these two together. We're adding them. And then that equals 16. If we look at the next column, or sorry, the next row up for, from seven to nine, well, 15 people scored between seven and nine. And if we add up all the people who scored less than nine, so less than the upper limit of this group, all right, so that would be these three scores, that equals 31, and so on and so forth. You go up the line until we get to the uppermost limit of 36, and we ask how many people scored at 36 or below, and that would be 130. Now you might ask, why do we want to sum all of the scores at or below a given number? Well, the answer is because then it gives us this cumulative frequency graph, which is pictured here. This is really nice because it tells us which types of scores are the least frequently achieved. And namely here, it would be these scores at the lower end and these at the higher end. And then you can tell because of the slope of this curve in the middle section, that quite a few scores occurred here in this middle section. So a steeper curve indicates greater frequency, whereas a less steep, more gradual curve or flatter curve indicates a less frequency at those scores or groups of scores. Now in statistics and in, in large groups of data, there are a number of curves and then also characteristics of curves that we have to talk about. A curve is a line that results when any scores, x, are plotted against a frequency, y, on a graph. And there is such a thing called a normal curve that we want to become very familiar with. It's also called the Gaussian curve, named after Carl Gauss. And it is bell-shaped. I'll draw it here, and we'll see pictures of it in a second. So it's symmetrical, meaning that if you divide it in half, the left and right sides are the same. They're inverse mirror images of each other. The mean, median, and mode are all the same value right there on the dotted line. We'll learn more about those in upcoming lectures. And the frequency of scores declines in a predictable manner as you move farther and farther from the center. So here's a normal curve. It's a little bit steeper than the one that I drew. Now a normal curve hinges on what's called the central limit theorem. This is a theorem that states that any randomly generated sum of numbers, if randomly generated multiple times up to infinity, the, the values would fall along a normal curve. So for the experiment, if you imagined a random number generator and you spit out 20 random numbers and then calculate the mean of those 20 numbers and store it, and you keep doing that as many data points as you can, and you plot all, all of those means, it would look like a normal curve. And the really neat thing is, is that most data that we collect in kinesiology actually approximates or follows a normal curve distribution. Okay, so it looks somewhat normal. And in fact, in statistics, a lot of the statistical tests that we will use assume that your data is at least somewhat close to normal, meaning that it's symmetrical, it's not too peaked, it's not too flat, it's not skewed to one side or the other. Now, there are some deviations from the normal curve that we will look at. The first is a bimodal curve. This curve has two modes. occurring here and here. And this is what happens when you have perhaps two very high frequency scores that are spread apart. And you will see two peaks or sometimes more peaks in the curve because of that. So this is a positively skewed curve and you can see that the curve is sort of shifting the entire thing over here to the left so that the right side is trailing off at a more gradual slope and the left side trails off faster. So what this results in is a greater number of outliers on the positive side, the larger numbers, and the majority or the bulk of the 
scores occurring closer to those um, negative or lower numbered scores because most of the scores are falling here. The opposite is true for a negatively skewed curve. Okay, so we see that most of the outliers of this curve will be here on the more negative or the smaller score side. And the bulk of the frequency of scores is located towards that right side. In each of these cases, the mean will fall not where the mode is, but probably somewhere to the left of it in the case of a neg negatively skewed curve and somewhere to the right of it in the case of a positively skewed curve. All right, so that was an overview of how we can organize and display data using frequency charts, using rank order distributions and histograms, as well as normal curves. Next, you're gonna to wanna to hop on over to the next video, which should be appearing somewhere on your screen soon, where I'll show you how to do this with a real data set in Excel. Thanks guys for watching this video. I look forward to seeing you again on the next video. Until then, move well, live well, and keep teaching other people to do the same.